Galileo was the father of modern science. I'm sure you've heard that more than once. For centuries, mankind floundered in the fog of ignorance until, one day, Galileo arrived to open our eyes to the light of reason. He showed the world the path to understanding and truth. But we wouldn't listen. We rejected his Evangelion and cast him to the dogs of the Inquisition, who forced him to recant his beliefs. For centuries, Galileo has lived in our collective imagination as a kind of inverse saint, a martyr for the cause of science against the sclerotic dogma of religion. But why? What exactly did Galileo do? Why is he held in such esteem? And what led to his eventual persecution? Did he really trigger a scientific revolution? Was there even a scientific revolution to begin with? How you read the life of Galileo will shape your view of all of scientific history. Because, somehow, Galileo has become scientific history. This is unfair, both to the general public, who are denied the flawed, contradictory, and fascinating figure Galileo truly was, and to Galileo himself, who, while he certainly would have appreciated and even approved of his eventual lionization, likely would have detested his title of father of modern science, since he too had idols from which he freely drew. The standard story of Galileo's time was that it was trapped in an Aristotelian stasis, with philosophers unwilling to see beyond the arguments of Aristotle, which had held sway for 2,000 years. But this is a blinkered view. Galileo did not weave his iconoclastic opinions from whole cloth. Anti-Aristotelianism had been brewing as far back as the Middle Ages, and while everyone still adhered to the classic model of the universe constructed by Claudius Ptolemy, which placed the Earth motionless at the center of the universe and all other objects in orbit around it, many had already argued against Aristotle's positions, and the works of Aristotle's rivals, such as Lucretius, Seneca, Hipparchus, Aristarchus, and especially Archimedes, were widely available and read. Galileo's predecessor, Tycho Brahe, had complained that, quote, Aristotle's individual words are worshipped as if they were the Delphic oracle, and Galileo's contemporary, René Descartes, declared Aristotelians, quote, less knowledgeable than if they had abstained from study. Even Ptolemy was being challenged as the alternative vision of the Polish canon Copernicus, which placed the sun at the center and the earth in orbit around it, was circulating among all learned astronomers. The world was primed for Galileo's arrival. Galileo's entry in the Book of Common Knowledge is severely edited. We tend to see him as perpetually the bearded sage he was in old age. But Galileo lived for 77 years and the events for which he is best known occurred in the latter half of his long life. A factoid I'm fond of neatly sums up this confusion. Galileo was born on the 15th of February, 1564, three months before William Shakespeare. But his first injunction from the church wasn't handed down until the 25th of February, 1616, three months before William Shakespeare died. There is a reason Galilean scholars refer to the first 45 years of Galileo's life, before he fashioned his first telescope in 1609, as his early period. To be fair, it would be wrong to describe that time as uneventful. True, he only ever visited five earthly locations, all within his native northern Italy, and unlike his hapless contemporary, Johannes Kepler, never saw his life upended by war, tragedy, or religious strife though the events that so scarred Kepler would play a distant role in Galileo's ultimate downfall. But within that seemingly empty time span burned a frantic intellectual life, and a home life chaotic enough to occupy even the hardiest mind. Galileo Galilei was born in Pisa, in the Duchy of Florence, an independent nation in the north of what is now Italy. Five years later, Cosimo I de' Medici, would expand its territory into the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, cementing de' Medici rule in the region for the next 170 years. Galileo owes his unusual name 
to Galileo Bonaiuti, an ancestor who had been a noted physician and, perhaps more importantly, a member of the upper house of the old Florentine Republic. In his honor, and likely for vicarious prestige, his descendants would rechristen themselves Galilei. By the time of Galileo's birth, that prestige had outlasted the money, and the Galileis were in the unenviable position of having to maintain a quasi-aristocratic lifestyle on an artisan's income. As Pisa at the time was considered something of a backwater, and because his father had been born in Florence, Galileo would always describe himself as un nobile fiorentino, a Florentine gentleman. As a child, Galileo constructed toy windmills and ships, indulging a talent for working with his hands at a time when such labor among the higher ranks was considered demeaning. He also proved to be a gifted painter, and often said that it likely would have been his career had his life been different. Galileo's father, Vincenzo Galilei, in many ways foreshadowed his son. He was a lutenist, singer, and musical theorist, whose best-remembered work, The Dialogue on Ancient and Modern Music, written, as many of Galileo's books would be, in Italian rather than Latin, improved on the simplistic musical theory of the Greeks by employing new consonances. He also conducted experiments with the tension, lengths, and diameters of strings to see how each affected sound. Like his son, he was fond of argument and debate. In a quote that could have come from Galileo's own lips, he said, It appears to me that they who, in proof of any assertion, rely simply on the weight of authority, without adducing any argument in support of it, act very absurdly. I, on the contrary, wish to be allowed freely to question and freely to answer you, without any sort of adulation, as well becomes those who are in search of truth. Nonetheless, all the theory in the world crumbled in the face of hard reality. The lute may have been the most popular instrument of the era, but it could not support a family of six. Galileo himself had become a lutenist of some skill and would play for the rest of his life, but his father needed him to earn real money. Likely since he granted his son his noble ancestor's name, Vincenzo had intended him to follow in the elder Galileo's footsteps and become a physician and to that end set about providing for his son's education. While still a child, Galileo could read both Latin and Greek. In 1572, Vincenzo returned to Florence with his family after securing a wealthy patron, and in 1577, at age 13, Galileo entered Vallambrosa, a Benedictine abbey southwest of Florence. There he learned the standard curriculum of the day, the trivium of grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium of music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. Galileo took to his studies as ravenously as you'd expect, but when he began making overtures to the order to join full-time, Vincenzo, realizing he'd have to pay for his son's upkeep if he took holy orders, removed him for health reasons. In 1581, at the age of 17, Galileo matriculated at the University of Pisa, where he rapidly gained a reputation for belligerently questioning his professors. His nickname was Il Contentatore, the arguer. He was not popular. One of his teachers at Pisa, Girolamo Borro, was a noted proponent of the experimental method and of excluding the theological and supernatural in physics. Galileo at first attempted to heed his father and pursue medicine, but after two years grew tired of its antiquated teaching much of which still relied on the writings of the second-century Greek physician Galen, who likely had never dissected a human. Instead, he began a relationship with Ostilio Ricci, the chief mathematician to the de' Medicis, who introduced him to Euclid and awakened in the young man a lifelong passion for geometry. Unfortunately, Vincenzo was unwilling and likely unable to extend Galileo's tuition for another two years, so Galileo left university without a degree. Galileo's time as a student at Pisa inspired one of the many legends that would gather around him, most crafted by Vincenzo Viviani, Galileo's final student, heir to his papers, and ardent disciple. According to Viviani, while attending Mass, Galileo stared at the chandelier, idly swinging back and forth above his head. Timing the period of each swing with his pulse, 
he noted that it remained the same even as the distance moved decreased. There is no evidence for this story, though Galileo did note the isochrony of pendulums, and how their period is determined by their length, rather than by the weight of the bob, as early as 1602. Many would later claim that this discovery led Galileo to invent the pulsologium, a device for measuring a patient's pulse. In fact, it was invented by the physician Santorio Santorio, an acquaintance of Galileo, who never challenged his priority. That is significant, since, as we shall see, if Galileo felt he had a case, he certainly would have acted on it. Another invention credited to Galileo via this discovery is the pendulum clock, whose accuracy Isochrony made possible. But while he designed such a clock at the end of his life, or rather described it since he was blind, he never built one. That honor, and patent, belongs to Galileo's most direct intellectual heir, Christian Huygens. By 1585, Galileo was in a predicament. His father had invested heavily in his sons no longer being a financial burden on his family. Now he was not only not a doctor, but anything else. To make ends meet, Galileo gave private tuition in mathematics to local rich kids, and acted as his father's assistant, where he gained first-hand knowledge of his experiments with sound. But his prospects were dimming. In a society in which connections were everything, Galileo was looking increasingly alone. And then, in 1586, Galileo wrote a tribute to the man who would become his idol, Archimedes. Unlike the airy Aristotle, who saw philosophy merely as an intellectual exercise, Archimedes got his hands dirty. The famous legend of him jumping naked out of his bath when he realized that water displacement could be used to measure density shows how he valued the experimental method. The story goes that the king of Syracuse asked Galileo to determine whether a goldsmith had swindled him by doping a supposedly pure gold crown with silver. Archimedes realized that if he placed the crown in water, measured the water it displaced, and then did the same to a lump of pure gold the same weight as the crown, he could determine if the crown displaced more water and was thus less dense. This gave birth to Archimedes' principle that the weight of an object submerged in a fluid is equal to the amount of fluid the object displaces. This, in turn, led to his most notable work, On Floating Bodies, a mathematical formulation of paraboloids, essentially idealized ship's hulls, and how they interact with surrounding fluids. It has been called the premier intellectual achievement of antiquity, and a work of mathematical genius. Galileo certainly thought so, because his treatise, La Bilancetta, the little balance, was essentially an elaboration on the legend of the crown, a sort of technological fan fiction in which Galileo asserts that the traditional reading of the story is wrong. There is no way Archimedes could have determined such a fine difference with just a tank of water. He must have employed a more precise measuring tool. Thus convinced, Galileo proceeded to design one himself. He imagined a balance in which the measured weight was submerged in water, and the counterweight was tied to a bar wrapped in wire. The wire turnings acted as a ruler, allowing one to clearly see the precise amount the counterweight had to move to balance the measured weight. La Bilincetta was Galileo's first scientific essay, written at only 22. Seeking recognition and potential employment, he sent manuscripts off to various mathematicians of note. The one who returned his call, so to speak, was Guido Baldo del Monte, the Grand Duke's inspector of fortifications. As it happens, del Monte's brother was a cardinal, which made him a very effective first patron. With their joint support, in 1588, Galileo delivered a series of lectures to the recently formed Florentine Academy on the conical geometry of Dante's Inferno. From Dante's claim that already the sun was joined to the horizon, whose meridian circle covers Jerusalem at its highest point, Galileo concluded that the first and widest circle of hell had to be equal to the radius of the earth. Using the dome of the Florentine Cathedral as a model, Galileo concluded that the dome of Dante's hell had to be 600 kilometers thick. In 1589, with his growing fame and, more importantly, the Del Monte's references, Galileo 
at last secured his first job, teaching mathematics at Pisa, the university he had only recently vacated. As first jobs go, this was a win, but for Galileo, it might as well have been purgatory. Mathematics was not a valued subject at Pisa, and his salary of 60 scudi per year was cripplingly low, and roughly a fifth what he could have earned as a physician. His teaching was largely confined to the first five books of Euclid and Scorobosco's Disfera, a standard astronomical text that was already 450 years old. He was fined repeatedly for missing lessons, so detested the rule requiring the wearing of the academic gown at all times that he wrote a poem about it. Quote, Turn back to that happy old time, free from all malice and all deceit, and you will find all year round everyone went naked, small and large, as they say in the books that know. There was no fear at the time of the French affliction, but by standing naked in the countryside, if one had some evil, it was evident. And if a woman had some flaw, she just kept it covered with three or four chestnut leaves. So people weren't duped. And nothing seen as good from the outside, if sun under a cloth, revealed itself as Pandora's box. Trapped within his gowned prison, Galileo let his mind wander to higher realms. De Moto Antiquiora, or The Older Writings on Motion, was a personal speculation never published in Galileo's lifetime. In fact, it was first published only in 1687, 45 years after his death, and, almost certainly not coincidentally, the same year Newton released his Principia. De Motu contains the earliest permutation of what would become Galileo's famous Law of Fall, that, air resistance permitting, light objects and heavy objects fell at the same speed. While Aristotle's claim that the speed at which objects fell was proportional to their weight had been challenged for centuries, John Philoponus had rubbished it a thousand years earlier, Galileo's initial proposal was that objects fell not in proportion to their weight, but to their density. This was also wrong, but in support Galileo argued that when a lighter body and a heavier body are dropped from height, the lighter body will initially outpace the heavier, but the heavier will catch up and then hit the ground first. When this experiment was repeated centuries later, the result was confirmed and revealed to be due to the human hand's tendency to release heavier objects later than lighter ones. While this didn't speak well of Galileo's still evolving understanding of the new physics, it did show that he had indeed tested his hypothesis with an experiment. It is at this time, when Galileo was a professor at Pisa, that arguably the best known legend about him supposedly occurred. According to Viviani, who was not even alive at this point, Galileo, perhaps in his gown, walked up the nearly 300 steps to the top of Pisa's legendary Leaning Tower and dropped two cannonballs in front of an audience of skeptical Aristotelians, all of whom were flabbergasted to see them land at the same time. To be clear, nothing in the historical record renders this story impossible, but several facts suggest it is untrue. For one thing, Galileo had not yet arrived at his law of fall when at Pisa, still adhering to his earlier incorrect ideas on density. For another, in 1612, an Aristotelian named Giorgio Coresio conducted that very experiment and claimed it vindicated Aristotle, suggesting Viviani might have got his historical wires crossed. In his Discourses on the Two New Sciences, a compendium of his unpublished work on physics, Galileo finally published in 1638, he gives an account of a similar demonstration. Quote, Aristotle says that a hundred-pound ball falling from a height of a hundred cubits hits the ground before a one-pound ball has fallen one cubit. I say they arrive at the same time. You find on making the test that the larger ball beats the smaller one by two inches. Now behind these two inches you want to hide Aristotle's ninety-nine cubits, and speaking only of my tiny error, remain silent about his enormous mistake. Nowhere does Galileo mention the Tower of Pisa, or even that he conducted the experiment himself. In fact, there is evidence he did not, because modern estimates of air resistance suggest that the difference between those two weights dropped from that height would be not two inches, but two meters. 
1587, Galileo made a connection that was to serve him well in future. Seeking a way out of his white elephant of a career, he traveled to Rome to ask Christopher Clavius, chief mathematician of the recently formed Society of Jesus, or Jesuits, for a recommendation for a vacant mathematics chair at Bologna. Although he failed in his mission, the friendship he struck with Clavius would last for decades, and their correspondence would include books and lectures Galileo would employ in his own teaching. While never as radical as Galileo, Clavius was unsatisfied with the Ptolemaic idea that an astronomer's job was simply to find a working model to explain what he saw, and hoped to understand its root causes. In 1591, Galileo's father died, and Galileo found himself the sole breadwinner of a fractious family. Despite his meager earnings, he faced multiple calls for funds for overly optimistic dowries promised for his two sisters. The dowry for his sister Livia represented 30 years' pay at Galileo's salary, and even when his fortunes improved, he was still sued and even threatened with prison by his brothers-in-law. Nonetheless, he notably spent over 100 scudi on his sister's wedding dress and a roll of damask curtains. The drive to live beyond his family's means was most likely that of his mother, Julia, scion of wealthy cloth merchants, who in future would spy on and steal from her own son rather than see her economic standing decline. Galileo appears to have had a similarly adversarial maternal relationship to that of Johannes Kepler, just without the witch trial. In short, Galileo needed a promotion. It is also speculated that he had made enemies at Pisa, a talent for which in future he would gain much renown. In 1592, he turned again to his patron, Guido Baldo del Monte, even conducting an experiment with him in which he threw a ball covered in paint beside a wall, allowing the paint to mark its trajectory. Rather than the jagged trajectory predicted by Aristotle, who did not believe motions could occur simultaneously, the ball tracked an even, clean arc, showing that both its forward and upward motions were combined. It's possible that by this time Galileo was already conducting his inclined plane experiments into the parabolic motion of projectile. Guido was as good a friend as ever, and after a quick letter to his cousin, Giovanni Battista del Monte, the commanding officer of the Venetian infantry, got Galileo a position as head of mathematics at the University of Padua. Padua at this time was part of the Republic of Venice, another independent Italian nation but, as its name suggests, one that managed to preserve its democratic character. Venice had been a republic for nearly a thousand years by this point, and would remain so for nearly two hundred years more. Like many republics, Venice had a reputation for rowdiness and intellectual freedom. In 1606, the Pope would declare Venice interdict, after their senate decided to try two priests in civilian court. All religious orders in Venice ignored it, except the Jesuits who were expelled. Venice was a haven for freethinkers, oddballs, nonconformists, and even Protestants. Galileo could not have landed a better gig. And he knew it. Galileo would later describe the 18 years he spent at Padua as the happiest of his life. His pay was three times what it had been at Pisa, and Padua was a larger university with greater academic resources. Somewhat ironically for Galileo, Padua was known worldwide as a medical school. The professor of anatomy, Hieronymus Fabricius, taught William Harvey, whose discovery of blood circulation would prove the final nail in Galen's coffin. It was while at Padua that Galileo made his greatest contributions to physics, though they were not published until later in his life and also where he met Marina Gamba, the woman who would bear his three children. Notice I did not say wife, as he never married. He was not named as the father in any of his children's baptismal certificates, and his daughter was listed as having been born in fornication. It is odd to think that for Galileo to have married Marina would have been a greater scandal than conceiving children in sin, as she was not only much younger, but... <gasps> of a lower social class. Nonetheless, their domestic arrangement appears to have been happy, except when Julia visited. Marina would die in 1612, 
at the age of just 42. A notion has persisted that before her death, she married a man named Bartoluzzi, and that Galileo remained on good terms with both of them, even getting her husband a job. However, it is more likely that Marina Bartoluzzi was a different person. In 1593, a completely arbitrary event took place that would affect Galileo for the rest of his life, and with it, the course of science. Anyone who has visited Italy in the summer can attest to its hellishness, and the houses of Italian nobility were equipped with sale di venti, or wind rooms, to deal with it. A wind room was basically a room with pipes strategically placed to draw in cool air from nearby caves. After a meal with much drinking and merrymaking, Galileo was, and would always be, an unapologetic bon viveur, he and two friends retired to a wind room to sleep it off. What those pipes carried into that room on that day is unknown, but Galileo and his friends awoke with high fevers, cramps, chills, headaches, and fatigue. His two friends did not survive the day. Galileo was deafened for a year. This event would leave Galileo chronically stricken with arthritis, often to the point of invalidity, and, some speculate, may have contributed to the blindness he suffered in his final years. One of the great unresolved questions about those 18 years in Padua, and frustration incarnate for anyone attempting a life of Galileo, is when he first became a Copernican. We know from his lecture manuscripts that he was still teaching the falsity of Copernicus and the old Ptolemaic arguments against heliocentrism while at Padua as late as 1606. But in 1597, in response to a beseeching letter from a young, eager, and ardent Copernican named Johannes Kepler, Galileo wrote, quote, Like you, I accepted the Copernican position several years ago and discovered from thence the causes of many natural effects, which are doubtless inexplicable by the current theories. I have written up many of my reasons and refutations on the subject, but I have not dared until now to bring them into the open, being warned by the fortunes of Copernicus himself, our master, who procured immortal fame among a few, but stepped down among the great crowd, for the foolish are numerous, only to be derided and dishonored. I would dare publish my thoughts if there were more like you, but since there are not, I shall forbear. If Galileo is speaking truthfully here, and as he was a born spin doctor, there is no reason to assume he is, there is a massive gap in our understanding of his life. This characteristically intellectually snobbish comment is the earliest record we have of Galileo's Copernicanism. But if he actually had been a Copernican for several years by that point, and if he had written up many of his reasons and refutations, we have no record of them. It should be noted that Viviani's descendants, unaware of what they had, sold Galileo's notes to butchers to wrap their sausages, notes that were only saved in 1750 when a Florentine intellectual named Giovanni Nelli noticed a Galilean manuscript wrapping his mortadella so there's no telling how much we've lost. All we do know is that by then Galileo had become a true believer that the earth moves around the sun, true enough to risk his reputation and his freedom. In 1597, possibly employing principles he discovered regarding the expansion of air with temperature, Galileo developed what has been called a thermoscope, a tube topped with a glass bulb suspended vertically in water. When temperatures rose, the air in the bulb expanded, drawing water up the tube. When temperatures cooled, the air condensed, pushing water downward. While this device allowed relative temperatures to be compared, it is not technically a thermometer, as it lacked a temperature scale. By far Galileo's greatest achievement at Padua, by some accounts the greatest achievement of his life and certainly his greatest contribution to physics, was his final resolution to the problem of falling bodies, which he outlined in the Discourses in the New Sciences, but formulated no later than 1604. The resolution came not with a single sweeping gesture atop an architectural wonder, but with a series of meticulous, precise experiments. Using parchment to reduce friction, 
Galileo rolled a series of balls down planes inclined at various angles, and noted that their velocity, measured with a precise water clock, increased with the angle of incline, rather than the mass of the ball. While he could not prove it conclusively, he argued that freefall was equivalent to following a plane with an inclination of 90 degrees, and so the same rules that applied to inclined planes applied to free fall. Conversely, he noted that as the angle decreased, the ball traveled an ever greater horizontal distance to cover the same vertical distance. He concluded that if the vertical distance were zero, the distance traveled by the ball would be infinite. That is, a surface free of any impediment, what we today would call frictionless, would allow a ball to continue indefinitely. While Galileo was not the first person to propose this idea, Giambattista Benedetti, an early inspiration for Galileo, had made similar claims decades earlier. He was the first to frame it in precisely this way. And while it wasn't quite the modern concept of inertia, for reasons I will explain later, it was another step in its formulation. From these experiments, Galileo developed three laws of nature. 1. A body moving on a level surface will continue in the same direction at a constant speed unless disturbed. 2. A falling object's velocity is proportional to time. And finally, 3. A falling object's distance is proportional to the time squared. In other words, the longer it falls, the faster it falls. These three laws were in direct contradiction to Aristotle. The latter two would eventually be confirmed by the Jesuit priest, and the minor star of this channel, Giovanni Battista Riccioli, namer of the moon's features and discoverer of Venus's still unconfirmed ashen light. The first law would be further developed by René Descartes. They would all eventually become common knowledge enough for Newton to read of them in his researches and combine them with Kepler's laws of planetary motion into a single overarching system that would for the first time both unify the earthly and heavenly worlds and transform physics into a single coherent science. But that was the future. For now, Galileo had worlds to discover, universes to unravel. But unfortunately, I will have to wait for the next video.